Hallelujah. I think we have everything fixed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so glad you're here to start off the end time sermon series. Let me preface it a little bit before we start. It was about a year ago that uh, a dear friend at the 830 service had given me some material on the end times and some prophetic messages and I begin to read, I begin to ingest them and marinate in them and just uh, cultivate them and begin to develop some sermons and just when I thought that was finished the Lord would add a little bit more and add a little bit more and add a little bit more and I, so I waited patiently uh, and then at the end of the summer came the Lord said now it's time to bring forth uh, what is thus saith the Lord for this season that we're in and I believe God's timing is perfect do you amen so I'm going to ask you to stand for the reverential reading of God's word if you could kindly open up your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5 I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version and then I will have uh, the message version up on the screen because I really want you to capture uh, what the Apostle Paul is saying to the young Timothy. And so if you have your Bible app U version, it should be on the Bible app. Follow along with me if you will as Paul instructs young Timothy. The Bible says, but know this, in the last days, someone say last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away now I put it up here in the message version I want to read it to you out of the message version do not be naive there are difficult times ahead as the end approaches people are going to be self-absorbed money hungry self-promoting stuck up profane contemptuous of parents crude coarse dog eat dog unbending slanderous impulsively wild savage cynical treacherous ruthless bloated windbags addicted to lust and allergic to god they'll make a show of religion but behind the scenes they're animals stay clear of these people Whew. that's a lot let us pray. Father, I thank you that you're equipping your church with the techniques that will be needed as we approach the second coming of Christ. I thank you for your word, for it is infallible, 100% truthful. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. I pray, Lord, that the Spirit and the word would come together for the next several weeks, Lord, to help equip us to evade any internal or external destructions. Allow us, Lord, to become holy as you are holy. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church at this hour. We ask for your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to start off the series very light this week. Amen. Very light. Uh, I want to ease you into the end times. Amen. Next week, we'll talk about the seven ancient spirits, all those spirits that were over uh, the Egyptian, the Roman, uh, uh, the Grecian Empire. Because, you know, those uh, spirits or those principalities have not gone anywhere, folks. Amen? They're still there. Uh, they're in operation, and I believe we can identify them by their characteristics and pray against them and pray for our children and our, our community and our culture 
Then we'll get into the most, uh, pow- one of the powerful ones is artificial intelligence. And we know what we read about the mark of the beast, but things are happening in our society and even right here and right here now in Delaware, which I'll get to in a little bit. And then on October 2nd, it's the coup de grace or the pinnacle of the teaching, which will be uh, Mystery Babylon and the belly of the beast. I'm going to show you how there are external evil forces at work right here in our nation that are coming against the Lord and the things of the Lord and the church and how God wants us to pray for his church. Amen. Pray for the church that we would continue to be salt and light. Amen. The enemy is trying to overtake the things that belong to God. Amen. So the phrase the last days or the end times uh, is synonymous It's spoken or written about very often. It's a term found in scripture to describe the prophetic time uh, in some scriptures before the return of Christ. Uh, Now, there are some other references, and I'll give you an example. 2 Peter 3.3, knowing that first scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Now, Peter had a reference because there's uh, two little dispensations of the end times. One... I'll explain to you that uh, when, when the church was birthed in the upper room by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, uh, there was, Jesus have gave a word that, that the temple will be destroyed and the, the people that were living in, uh, in Jerusalem at the time would be eradicated or dispensed and no one would be living in Jerusalem. Actually, no one would be living in Israel for 1,878 years until the rebirth of Israel in 1948. Okay, so there's two dispensations. One, the church is birthed, and Jesus says that, that, that this land will no longer be inhabited. And what happens? In 70 AD, the Roman army comes, destroys the city, and it would not be inhabited for 1,878 years. Is that amazing? That's just what Jesus was alluding to. So when they talk of, in some of the scriptures, Peter refers to uh, the prophet Joel, in the last days this would happen and that would happen, there was a dispensation he was referring to, which is from the, from the birth of the church to when the Roman Empire came in on, under, what, what's his name, Tom, Vespasian? Is that Vespasian, he came in and they burnt it all to the ground and said, no one's going to be here anymore. And that's exactly what Christ said. So there's a reference to that portion of end days, but also there is a second portion where we hear in scripture. Now, Jesus gave two sermons, one on the, two, two big sermons, one on the Mount of Olives and one on, uh, one on the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is from uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's called the Beatitudes, right? Or, or don't have an attitude, right? And so he gives a ser- the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, but he also gave another sermon on a mountaintop called the Olivet Discourse. Why do they call it the Olivet Discourse? Because it was on the Mount of Olives, and we find that in the scriptures in a few places. In Matthew 24, he talks about some signs of the end times. In Luke 21, he talks about the signs of the end times. And in Matthew, in, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 13, he talks about these are the signs of the end times. Now, Jesus was talking about uh, some signs before the second coming of himself, amen? There'll be wars and rumors of wars and famines and floods and pestilences, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes. Nation will rise up against nation. And all this has to happen because they call it the birth pain. Someone say birth pains. The birth pains of the Messiah. Come on, ladies. You know when the baby's coming. Amen. Because the contractions get shorter and harder because the cervix is opening. And something's about to be birth. Same way in the spirit. These birth pains get closer and closer and closer. Now the New Testament instructs the followers of Jesus to be aware or to be on the lookout for certain behaviors in culture or in society, certain economic developments, certain geographical things like, you know, the increase of the hurricanes and the earthquakes and cyclones and all these things happening in the earth. Why why is that happening in the earth? Because the, the earth is groaning to be redeemed. 
Are you following me? The earth, the birth pains are, are taking place in the earth because the earth is waiting for Christ to return to redeem the land. Amen. Wow. So there are some spiritual signs which I want to talk about as we start this sermon series off. And Jesus himself instructs his followers to be armed with some survival techniques. Amen? I don't know, years ago, did you watch that show, Survivor? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just looking to survive society. I'm not looking to be put on an island somewhere. And here you go. See what you can make of it. We'll give you 50000 I think I'll keep my feet here in Delaware and do what I can here. Amen? So there was this show, Survivor, and they, they equipped them with all these techniques. And I believe the Word of God equips us with some techniques. And I'm going to give you five of them today as we start out this sermon series. Very light, but, you know, a little bit on the uh, prophetic side. But I want to speak to you the words of Jesus to lay a good foundation for where we're going in the next couple of weeks. Are you ready? Number one, Jesus says, keep your eyes open. Amen. Keep your eyes open. Matthew 24, 42 through 44 on the Olivet Discourse. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that the master of the, if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. Jesus' first word to the disciples. Boys, keep your eyes open. You don't need a device on your house, right? To let us know. Denise and I, we go on vacation. We set the device. So if anything moves in the house, I get a text message or an email saying there's some activity. Come on, right? Jesus says, keep your eyes open. Watch. I'm not talking about a wrist watch. I'm talking about watch with your eyes. There's a reason he's saying watch. The idea of setting a specific watch is in Jesus' day was infused throughout the Bible and the Roman times. A watch or a night watch would be the first watch is 6 at night to 9 at night. Second watch, 9 to 12 midnight. Third watch, 12 to three o'clock, fourth watch, three in the morning to six in the morning. The Bible says that Jesus came walking on water to the disciples at the fourth watch. That was three o'clock in the morning. What were they doing out on the fishing boat? Because if you love fishing, you know you're out on the water. Come on. Just as the sun gets up. Why? Because the fish, when the water, when the sun hits the water and warms the water, the fish come to the surface and they're easily caught. So the fourth watch we were, we're, we're seeing that it's broken up into pockets of time, watches as they call. We learned that in Matthew 24, 25 when he came walking on water. Watch in Greek means to be sober, to be alert, to be awake. We've heard on so many occasions, how many of you heard, oh, the church is asleep. Huh? Amen. The church is asleep. The admonition here is to remain alert to the fact that the Lord can return at any time. The hour when we least expected, Jesus said. Through technology, now we have safety cameras, even in the church. Why do we have them in the church, someone said. I said, for the safety of our children, that's why. Because we want to keep a watch and watch over our children. We want to watch over our checkbooks too, amen? How many people still go through line items on their checking account? And you'll, you'll notice someone helping themselves to your money. I had someone taking $60 a month out to an offshore Cayman Island account a couple of years ago. Somehow they got my debit card and they were helping themselves until I really looked and said, 60, 60, 60. For six months, they were taking $60 a month. They were helping themselves. Often they'll dry run it with $5 just to make sure it goes through. Just to, so, so you have to watch your finances. You have to watch your children. You have to watch your P's and Q's, amen? And you also have to watch for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What am I saying? we got to keep a watch on various things in our lives, even our spiritual walk. That's why I felt prompted to do the end time sermon series. I want to infuse it into your hearts to make sure to remember to never forget Jesus' words in the Bible. 
that he could return at any time in the hour that we do not know. So we are to be on the lookout for these things or what I call signposts that can easily identify that the signs of the times. Have you ever been so codependent, and my wife's going to laugh, have you ever been so codependent on the GPS that, you know, uh, what I done, I turned the volume down because I can't stand the voice, right? And so I turn left, turn right, make a U-turn, and I'm just like, oh, please. And I turn it down, and what happens? I go right past the exit, <laughs> right? Have you done it? I've done it. And my wife says, what are you doing? You're not watching. I say, I can't watch the road and the GPS at the same time. So how do we keep a watch? And watch and be spiritually discerning. I wasn't watching. The fact is I wasn't listening. We must set up watches in our life. And be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. With the signs of the times that are among us. And we're going to get into this series. And by the time... We hit this one artificial intelligence. I'm telling you, you will not leave here the same way you came in. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be revealing some stuff to me throughout the year. And I've been taking my time and documenting. And the way he put it together and crafted it, it's remarkable. I give God all the glory, amen? But he's telling us, folks, Parkview, the church, watch. For look up, your redemption draws nigh. Point number two, that second word we hear pastor all the time, pray. Number two, pray. Number two, pray. Jesus said at the Olivet Discourse in Mark 13, 33, take heed, watch, and pray. Now, if I just watch, oh, I see, it and I do nothing about it, what good is it to watch? But Jesus says, watch and add prayer to what you're watching. So if the enemy comes in like a flood, you could come against them with your prayer. So there's a reason I'm watching to procure me to do some action, which is to pray. I'm not just going to watch and observe the enemy comes in like a flood and takes my finances, takes my family, takes my future, takes my friends. And yeah, I'm watching, but I'm doing nothing about it. No, watch and pray. Prayer is a weapon. Praise is a weapon, and it thwarts the work of the enemy, amen? He says, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is, like the man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, that's us, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Verse 35, watch therefore, that you not, do not know when the master is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, least coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. Whew. And what I say to you, I say to you all, watch, watch. Jesus says not only to watch, but to pray. Take heed. He uses the word take heed in Greek. This should get our attention, amen? Amen. Several times when Christ was praying, the disciples fell asleep. They said, oh, this is so boring. It's so boring. And Jesus comes. He says, boys, I just asked you to pray for an hour. Peter, wake up. What's wrong with you? He was sleeping at the most crucial time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Don't you be sleeping over there. I hear you going there. I'm watching you. Blipo, the Greek word is, to be aware, to behold, to perceive in regards to sight, to open your eyes. Jesus follows that up and combines it with the word prayer. You know, uh, pray about what you see. Come on. Hey, where's, uh, hey, Liz, I saw that, uh, y'all went to dinner, that new place, right? I saw the post. I was just putting the finishing touches on the message, artificial intelligence, and y'all go on Facebook and put a post with those robots serving them dinner. Oh, you weren't there. Okay. So they put a picture. What's the name of the place? Captain Robots or something? Captain Cre So a robot comes and serves you so much for minimum wage. Just saying. I wonder how, many, how much taxes they're paying on that. Anyway. So I'm finishing the message on artificial intelligence. They put a post up. And here comes this robot with his bellies open with all the food. And it comes to the table. It's got, and I thought... Oh my goodness, watch and pray. The timing of this, folks, is incredible. 
What, that's what I'm telling you. This, this is starting to spiral out of What I'm going to show you is, is deep, man. I'm telling you, it's deep. I'm telling you, it's deep. And the Lord has just gave me a wink of confirmation, Arnold, saying, this is exactly what I've been telling you about, Chris. Tell the church to watch and pray. Robots serving food. And it's, gonna, it's even going to get worse. Watch. Watch and pray. If we watch without praying... We'll certainly see the enemy coming, but do nothing to exercise the power to defeat him. Prayer is a weapon or a tool in the hand of God that makes us, allows us to become more than conquerors. It's important, folks, not just to maintain our relationship with Christ, but to grow in our relationship with Christ by having an active prayer life. That's why we have so much prayer going on at the church. A few, last year, John, I went to the doctor. I was very lethargic. And very, like, lack of energy. And for me, that's odd. Right? And so I went to the doctor. He did the blood work. And he says, you're severely lacking in vitamin D. And he says, are you tired? Are you lethargic? And I said, yeah, oh, that 3 o'clock, I'm running for uh, iced coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. Only to get this caffeine spike and at 6 o'clock be worse than at 3 o'clock. Come on. Am I telling the truth? So I was relying upon this caffeine when what really I needed was vitamin D. And I went to the store and I got vitamin D. Now I don't need Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts at 3 o'clock because what I'm taking in is energizing me. What am I trying to say? Prayer will energize your spiritual life. Prayer has the same effect, coincidentally, that, that vitamin D does. It helps energize me. I wake up in the morning, I meet the Lord for some prayer. I have some prayer for afternoon, for lunch. I have some prayer at 3 o'clock. I have prayer over my meal. I have prayer at night. Infuse some aspect of prayer into your life so you're not only watching, but you're praying. Amen? This is what Christ said to do. These folks, watch and pray, is part of the antidote for the end times. Prayer used to be a, just a fill-in activity for me, but now it has become a priority in my spiritual exercises. We need it for spiritual survival in the end days. When we pray, we stay mentally alert, pray the scriptures. I can't believe all the material that is just flying out of the prayer room. Every time I walk in there, we've bought little pamphlets and booklets for y'all to take home to energize your prayer life and jumpstart your prayer life. And so I can't believe every time I go in there, the shelves are empty. Praise the Lord. That means people are praying. That's my job to get you closer to him, not to be him for you, come on, but to get you closer to Jesus, amen? And so you, I'm so glad y'all utilized all of those prayer helps. Watch, pray, number three, anti-temptation armor. Anti-temptation armor. Christ made a very significant statement to his 11 disciples there. Christ said to Peter, listen, Peter, you're going to mess up, dude. I'm telling you, you're going to mess up. But let me warn you, Peter, about your spirit and your flesh going to war. There will always be a conflict. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and least you enter into. Oh, why must I watch? Why must I pray? Least I enter into temptation. Why? Because my spirit is willing to get up for church and be on time. Thank you. But the flesh wants to have its own way. I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to Bible study. I don't want to do this, Pastor. I want, to, I want, to, I want what I want. But, the, but the, the, the spirit is willing. But he told Peter, your flesh is weak. The flesh, the carnal man, the carnal woman, has to come under subjugation to the spirit man and spirit woman. That's what the book of Galatians is about. Paul compares and contrasts the works of the flesh with the works of the Holy Spirit operating in you. And you can't have both operating simultaneously. One will give way to the other. What you feed is what you become. If you feed the flesh, you become what pastor calls a flesh monster. Saying, I have Christ, you have religion, but lack the power thereof. But when you're feeding the spirit, you're walking in the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You have that all operating, and it's evident when someone says, I see, I saw you at the gas station. You weren't acting like a Christian. And you're like, oh, that was, 
the flesh. So we have to be, have an awareness of what the flesh looks like. The Greek word here that he used, temptation, is as, asenithi. It means no strength. It means like I had without the vitamin D. Feeble, sick. Uh, both, both physically and, follow me, morally sick. How many know our nation has become morally sick? Calling good evil and evil good. Well, what's the antidote, Pastor? Right here. Right here. Right here. Well, don't take that outside the four walls. Don't bring that into the schools. Ah, oh, wonder why. Because since it's the antidote, you got to keep the antidote away. Watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. Ephesians 3.16 that he, Christ, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, the strength with my, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in your inner man or inner woman. Christ will strengthen you on the inside so you can live as a Christian on the world on the outside. That's what Ephesians is talking about, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The implication here is watching and praying will assist us from falling asleep or falling into temptation. Remember, remember he said, uh, Peter, P, he got to the garden and he said to me, Peter, Peter, wake up, wake up, Peter. What are you doing sleeping? I just said, can you just pray for an hour? And Peter's a, he's snoring. See, it's impossible to walk in the flesh and the spirit simultaneously. Galatians 5.16 I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Even in the Lord's prayer, Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If we don't pray, the odds of being defeated by temptation will greatly increase. Prayer, listen to me, prayer places a temptation roadblock and can serve as an anti-temptation piece of armor to strengthen you on the inside, or as Paul refers to, to strengthen your inner man or inner woman. And that only happens through prayer. Amen? Watch, pray, lest you enter into temptation. Because the days, folks, it isn't going to get any better out there. Newsflash. It's not going to get better out there until we take what we have in here and get out there. It's going to get darker and darker out there. We are the light of the world, the city on a hill. Don't hide your light under a bushel or a basket, but get out there to the highways and byways and share the love of Christ with everyone you know. And that will dispel the darkness. Number four, get some oil. Get some oil. In Christ's time, we have learned that the clay lamps were used for lighting. Remember we did the, 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 the fool, five foolish and the five wise virgins and I purchased these with the wicks on them and, and, and the oil is put into these and then it has to be ignited to illuminate. Come on somebody. What am I telling you? The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? Stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Stay filled. Luke 12, 35, the scripture says, let your waist be girded, means keep a belt on, let your waist be girded and your lamps be burning. If our lamps aren't burning, when we go into the darkness, we won't shine the light. So we need to keep and get some oil, belts fastened and oil to see where we're heading because if we watch and we pray, and we avoid temptation, God will certainly send us on an assignment. And our assignment, we need to have oil when we go. Unlike the five foolish virgins that we talked about over the, over the summer, we talked about five that were ready and five that weren't ready. The five that weren't ready ran to an all-night Wawa, come on, to try and get some oil. But at that time, Jesus said, the door is only going to be open for a short amount of time. So come in now. He said, no, hold on. We're unprepared. We have to go get oil. Jesus said, Baminos, see you later. We'll close the door. You aren't prepared. He wasn't trying to be mean. He taught them how to be prepared for the things that were coming. He said five were wise and five, they were just foolish. Amen. Some had some oil. Some did not. Some ran at the last minute. We know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Our lamps, spiritually, is a metaphor 
for our spiritual light shining within us. It's why Christ referred to you and I as the light of the world. Who remembers the song? This little light of mine. Okay. See, you have plenty of choir rehearsal people here. They could sing. They're just not telling you. What must we do as the church? Keep the oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the zeal for God burning in our hearts, and, and feed the oil. Jesus encountered the two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 32. Watch what it says here. And they said to one another, did our heart, not, not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, so these two guys are walking on the road and Christ appears nowhere. The resurrected Christ appears nowhere to them and starts to talk to them and minister to them. And they're saying, something's about to set me on fire. Why? Because they had the oil. They just need the igniter. And they had one touch with the ignition switch, who was Christ. And they're like, oh man, did you hear what he said? Man, that's why we come back, we come to church. Because the word of God doesn't return void, amen? And we hear the word and it activates the Holy Spirit in us. and say, man, I want more oil. I want more of that. I need more. I want more. I crave more. This is the only thing. When you eat more of this, you get hungrier for it. It's the opposite of food. When you eat food, you get full and you push away from the supper room. But when you come into God's house and you eat the bread of life, you get hungry and you get to the upper room. Come on. Amen. Okay. Jesus ignited that oil that was residing in their spirit and woke up something in their hearts that they were like, who was that? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, check your oil light. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have a treasure, watch this, we have a treasure in earthen vessels. Do you realize as you're a born again believer, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity resides right inside of you. I still can't fathom that. It's remarkable that God would take up residence, a dwelling place, Ephesians chapter 3. He takes up a home in my heart. You got to allow him to renovate it just like them home shows. That's right. A little renovation sometimes will do us good. Amen. He lives inside of us. The Bible says the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of your mortal body. Amen. Amen. Whew. God places an infinite treasure inside of us. Folks, keep your oil full. Go to the ignition switch. Get it lit and turn it into spiritual fuel. Don't let it go rancid. Have you ever went in the closet and had rancid oil? Amen? He's invested part of himself inside of us. It was last year, Denise, if you remember, the winter season was in full swing. And I woke up, and Denise is like, it's freezing in here. I'm like, uh-oh. I ain't saying nothing, but I have an idea what's going on. I said, let me go outside and check the oil tank. So I get dressed up. I go outside, and we don't have gas across the street yet, right, uh, Jay? We just, some, someday we'll have it. But I have this big oil tank in my backyard. And there's this little thing that goes up, a spout, and a little bobblehead that's in it. And I look, on, I look at it, and I'm like, it's half full. And I'm inside trying to figure it out. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit said, you better go check that again. So I went outside, Gene, and I unscrewed the top. And I took that little bobblehead, and I touched it, and it went. And I hit the tank, and it was empty. I said, I Dios mijo. I'm in trouble with the boss. I said, honey, you better break out the electric heaters. Our tank ran out of oil. How did this happen? It's like, let me, let me explain. <laughs> let me explain. No, my fault. I screwed, the, and you know, it, it, I promise it won't happen again. I called up Fredericks, because you guys had to start it over again, uh, prime the pump. I had to call the oil company, come. But I learned the lesson both in my house and in my heart to keep the oil tank full. Amen? 
So one coincides with the other in the natural and in the spiritual. Keep the tank full. Check your gauges. Come on, somebody. The oil light comes on. I know y'all ignore the light. Come on. That's okay. See, Denise's car, it tells you 30%, 20%, 10%. Change oil now. You got to know, folks, when you're running on empty. As I said, it's not going to get any lighter outside. It's only going to get darker. We are called to be the light. Amen? Amen? Keep oil in your tank. Be ready for the Lord to ignite you. Yield and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Allow him to open up your spiritual eyes. You get in the word of God. Allow him to teach you the scriptures. He is our best teacher. He lives inside of you. Allow him to see and allow him to allow you to hear the purposes of Christ in your life. God has placed the greatest gift inside of you and I in the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, number one, watch. Number two, pray. Number three, anti-temptation armor, right? Number four, get some oil. Number five, take it to the bank. Now, we went over the parables this summer, and a considerable amount of the parables conceal instruction from Jesus on how to be a wise steward. Everybody say steward. steward. And how to handle our finances uh, and make proper choices in life. We looked at this parable called the parable of the talents. And, and what do we do with what God has given us? What do we do with what God has given us? He goes through the parable. He gives one five talents, two talents, and one talent. The guy with five invested it. The guy with two invested it for a return. And the guy with one took it and hid it. And Jesus said, why did you take what I've given you and hide it and not at least put it in the bank to get any interest and get a return? The storyline or the bottom line is to invest wisely in what you have in order to multiply it into having more. There are times when God blesses us financially in our lives. And with that financial blessing... Uh, sometimes he prompts our heart to give to the work of the Lord. We give to missions. We give to faith promises. Uh, Denise and I just got a renewal card in the mail. We supported orphanages in, in, in India. And we have adopted a little girl uh, that is in the orphanage. And we send 20 or $30 a month in order to support the work of the Lord there in India with all these girls that are orphans. And uh, Dania has a pen pal, and he'll, the girl, wherever it is, will write back and forth on the little cards that come, and, 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 and it's a, for a small investment. Now, I have that because I don't, I don't have the Dunkin' Donuts every day for $3. Do you see stewardship, what the Lord's teaching us about stewardship? I, I, I so appreciate all of your heart and your sacrificial giving. And how you give so adamantly to the Lord. And how you give timely to the Lord. It enables us to do what we need to do here in this church. To launch different ministries. To pour in to the children. To bless the youth group, the middle school, the young adults. Everything we do is because you have been faithful with what the Lord has given you. Amen. Acts 20 verse 35 says, I have shown you in every way laboring like this. That you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said it's more blessed to give than to receive. See giving might empty your pocket. But will never empty your heart. Amen. Amen. And the more we give. The more we pour out. The more God can pour into us. And his cup is bigger than mine. Amen. I thank you for your generosity. In your heart. The way you serve the Lord. Some people serve and give till it hurts. Amen. And sometimes it costs us more than we could ever ask or think. Scripture indicates that financial increase can be used for the kingdom of God. We learn that the tithe belongs to the Lord. Essentially, I have learned that everything I have belongs to the Lord. I've gotten beyond the tithe. I just say, Lord... It all belongs to you. So there's not, not even a question of, of any of that. Why? Because I've matured into that place of knowing that the house, the car, everything, the church, everything belongs to the Lord. I'm just a steward. 
you know, and I render to the Lord what the Bible says to give because you know something? If it's all his, when the bills come in, guess whose the bills are? You got it. They belong to the Lord. And I don't have to fret or worry because I'm faithful in the area where God asked me to give and to sow and to be an extraordinary blessing. We all do that. And so when my bills come and say, I don't know how this is going to work out. Oh, by the way, Lord, this is not my bill. It's your bill. See how you transfer ownership when you're obedient? Amen. Christ took a lad's lunch. He took a young boy's lunch. He multiplied it and fed thousands. And the little guy, have 12, he had 12 baskets of leftover. Why? Because well, I've learned this. Hear me now. What you let go of determines what God can bring you. If you hold on to it, he can't multiply it. The miracle of multiplication is letting go of what you have so he can add to it. Amen? The need was met and the multiplication miracle continued. Investing is not wrong. But we have to use extreme caution, prayerfulness, and wisdom. Jesus teaches that a portion of increase is used so the kingdom of God can advance. As I said, giving never empties my heart. It may hit my pocket, but it doesn't hit my heart. We pour out so God can pour in. I tell you, folks, as we get closer and closer and closer to the end of days. And I don't know when there it's coming and I'm not here to scare anyone or to persuade anyone. Jesus even said he doesn't know the day and hour. Only the Father knows. Amen? Amen. Only the Father knows. But he did say there are signs of the times that are among us. Earthquakes, famines, wars, rumors of wars. We see the birth pains of the Messiah becoming so evident. And then the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna show you how those ancient spirits are operating. I'm going to show you as it is in the book of Daniel where he said knowledge will increase and this technology and the mark of the beast and how robots are going to play a big part in that. The Bible says in the book of Revelation they made an image and the image came alive and started to speak. You hear what I said? An image, an image, an icon, an image, imago. A statue, something came alive and it began to speak and the beast gave power to the image. We're there. We're there. We're there. I'm telling you, we're there. When robots are serving me lunch, that's the image, David. It's, it's probably saying, can you pay that bill? It's not, now it's not only serving, it's speaking. Come on. Who's got a phone? Let me see. Siri, why are fire engines red? I'm pretty sure it's to match the big red lights. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Siri, what's the square Siri, what's the square root of 144? The answer is 144. Now don't do your homework that way. <laughs> I'm warning you. I'm telling you, folks, we're beyond there. We're beyond there. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit has given me some deep stuff. And I held on to it for a year. Because I, I, I always will be obedient and wait on the Lord. And then the Wednesday night teaching, I can't teach it here because of the kids on Wednesday night, October 2nd. But I'm telling you, it will mess you up. It will mess you up. And all of a sudden, the scales will fall off your eyes. And you'll see it for what it's worth because it's the word of God. I'm not making it up. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm going to give you the word of God and let the ax fall where it may. I'm going to give you the truth of God's word and allow the Holy Spirit to filter it through your spirit so you can say, wow, we are spiraling exceedingly like a speeding train. Towards the end of time, towards, towards the end days. Are we, are we there yet? No, we're not. But we're seeing birth pains and we're seeing some things come alive. If the worship team would come. So what I want to do right now is uh, ask you to exercise your faith in a small way. I was contacted by Convoy of Hope last week and they had asked, uh, could you take up an offering 
for the people in the Bahamas. Um, and so I thought, you know what? I wanted to do it last week, but that altar call was amazing. Amen? And so I waited, and then lo and behold, the fifth point of today is take it to the bank, right? And so I think the Lord, again, is sovereign. But we're going to take up an offering today. If you could give 5 or $10, whatever the Lord has on your heart. I'm not trying to coerce you to give. I want you to give as the Holy Spirit leads you. If we all gave 10 bucks, we would, it would be great. Amen? But they're in the Bahamas right now. And they're helping put people's lives back together. They've been totally decimated. And they've asked the church to take up an offering. I don't have my wallet on me, but Denise, make sure we, we give something, please. And so we're going to ask you to sow a seed. We're going to get it to Convoy of Hope by Wednesday so that they can, they can bless, bless those people who've lost everything. It's one way the church can be salt and light. Amen. That they'll know that Jesus is with them there. They shall know them by their fruit. So we're going to ask you to stand to your feet as the ushers make their way forward. We're going to be obedient and sow a seed into the into the destruction of the hurricane, which was a sign of the last times. We're going to ask you to sing with us, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Go ahead, Jeremy. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner. Call back the sinner. Wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your faith Jesus is coming soon like a bride waiting for her groom will be church ready for you every heart longing for our King we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, we sing, we wait for you, so we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. So we wait. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. Oh, we wait, oh, we wait, we wait for you. God, we coming soon like a bride waiting for her groom will be church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing like a bride Waiting for her groom will be church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Have you
You've been blessed today. You've been blessed to be a blessing. As I said, I just come in a little light today just to get us moving forward a little bit. Watch. Say it with me. Watch. Pray. Anti-temptation armor. Get some oil. Take it to the bank. He'll never let you down. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you during the week. Don't forget to come out with the kids on Wednesday night. They will be blessed.